Welcome to the BPRG community. We are lucky enough to be here today with Annie and Michael Mithoffer. We had a lovely informative conversation with meeting on September 13th and unfortunately we were not able to record it and so they have very graciously accepted our invitation to come back for an hour and I'm feeling very very lucky to have this extra time with them. So um, we will not be able to completely recreate what we did on the 13th but I think most of the issues will come up and I do have questions that were asked on the 13th and so they don't come up in the conversation, then I will try and answer, ask those to give voice to our BPRG community. So let me reintroduce Annie and Michael Mithoffer. Um, many of you know who they are, but I think it's important to acknowledge the huge contributions they've made as the lead therapists and designers of the MAPS protocol for the MDMA-assisted psychotherapy for PTSD. They were not only the initial therapists for the phase two studies, they also then trained the therapists who completed the other therapists who completed the phase two studies. And since then, they have trained hundreds of therapists who are doing the phase three studies, will be doing expanded access, and will be providing this very important therapy um, once it becomes legal, which we hope will be in the next couple of years. Personally, enough to meet them in 2012 when I crashed the course, the training course for the Boulder Phase II therapists. And, and since then, I would describe them as my mentors, my heroes, my teachers, and my friends. Mm. And I suspect hundreds of people would use those same words to describe them. They've touched the lives of so many people. Thank you so much, Annie and Michael, for being here again. And we're really looking forward to hearing what thoughts you have. I should tell people I've asked them to talk really from the heart and authentically is what it's felt like to be part of this process for all these years. When they started, it was really um, not at all established. And so to have seen the, the meteoric, meteoric this um, field has been amazing, um, and I'd love to hear their perspective on that. I know people also are really interested in what it's like to work together as a couple in intense therapy like this, and many other topics that I'm sure they will touch on. So thank you so much. Look forward to hearing from you, and I'll keep asking questions as they come up. Oh, thanks, Anne. Thanks for your kind words. <clears throat> we, you know, it's... I, we're so grateful for our friendship with you and Shippen, and uh, it's fun to have a chance to talk again. Yeah, so good to be here with you and um, spend another little chunk of time talking <laughs> and, yeah. When you said meteoric, I thought, well, sometimes it's felt like it's really racing along. Sometimes it's been like, do we have to wait 76 years or something <laughs> for it to come <laughs> around again? <laughs> Right. Oh. Well, it, it must have felt very slow in the beginning and now it's growing exponentially. So, I mean, just in the 10 years which, that I've been involved, which is relatively short time, it's been extraordinary, the change. So thanks. Right. Large yeah. part to you. Yeah, the recent acceleration, not only in the, you know, MAPS, the progress with the MAPS research and now finishing the first phase three trial um, in the whole psychedelic, world of uh, research and treatments in general it feels like it's it is like a meteor that um except it's not very you know with meteors they usually have a lot of information about where it's headed but i, <laughs> I don't feel we have that with this situation so it's a pretty interesting time right what well, do you want to start michael where where you started <clears throat> how you switch gears okay, we're coming sure. up on october 10th we're coming up on, um, well, January is really when we first got together, but we're coming up on our 50th anniversary together. Oh my goodness. Um, <laughs> so that feels really momentous too. And um, just thinking about working together and that we didn't 
work together from the beginning, of course. But um, yeah, do you want to talk about when you start when you switched? Sure. Yeah. So that was, was sort of a yeah. changing point. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I mean, to me, maybe the heart of it all is that what an incredible experience it's been to be able to do this together mm -hmm. for but and this being <laughs> so much more than just the research, but the, the, the privilege of being able to do this work together has been tremendous to share that. So, right. um, and we, you know, as we said, we didn't set out to be researchers at all. Um, we um, were clinicians and, um, you know, I went after 10 years of practicing emergency medicine, uh, I went back and started a psychiatry residency training in 1991 um, because I, you know, I'd been, I'd enjoyed the emergency room for a long time, but I was getting <clears throat> tired of it. And part of that was um, just a sense of, I'm, you know, always doing things to people, um, which was sometimes very useful, um, but it wasn't, I, I was kind of longing for a different kind of relationship, a more collaborative way of working with people on healing and <clears throat> also getting more and more curious about the kind of antecedent events that were leading up to people showing up in the emergency department, you know, with wound, gunshot wounds and knife wounds and overdoses and lots of problems from not taking care of themselves. So <clears throat> anyway, I was drawn to look for a change in my medical career. And I came across an article about Stan Groff when I, you know, I was thinking what I wonder, the MD, MD degree must be good for something more compelling than what I'm feeling about the ER right now. And <clears throat> when I read the article about his, his work, I went to the uh, medical school library and, to see if they had any books. This was the Medical University of South Carolina, um, not a hotbed of um, progressive psychedelic thinking, um, at least not then. <laughs> That's changed actually. Um, but uh, there was his book, Beyond the Brain, was in the library and no one had ever taken it out before because he could, <laughs> you know, they had the stamps in the back of the book. You could tell it had never been taken out. Uh, <laughs> I've never been back to check it, but I, I, you know, you probably can't tell so easily anymore. Anyway, so I got that book and I read it and it had a profound impact on me because I, you know, being in college in the 60s, uh, we had both had psychedelic experiences and found them to be very powerful and important and sometimes very terrifying and confusing. Um, and so when I we had left that behind for a long time. Um, but when I read that book, it, it struck me about how powerfully it, it seemed to explain experiences that I'd had 20 years before with psychedelics. And so I thought, yeah, this is, this is what I want to pursue. So I, I, um, and I wonder, I didn't even know Stan Groff was still around, but I, <laughs> so I, it said something about the, uh, Mero, you know, it, had in the book about working at the Maryland Psychiatric Research Institute, uh, where which was going to be the you know premier psychedelic research place in the world that Stan was going to be uh, running um, after he was at Hopkins um, before it all got shut down. So I called them and uh, said I'm looking for Dr. Stanislav Groff, and um, <laughs> at first they kind of seemed to pretend they didn't know who I was talking about. Um, because it's now a schizophrenia research <laughs> institute, I believe. It has, they, they don't have anything to do with psychedelics. So, but they finally said they thought he was still alive and somewhere in California. Anyway, I, I found out not only was he very much alive, but he had a training program in holotropic breathwork and transpersonal uh, psych psychology, uh, which was you know, really based on how to work with these non-ordinary states based on what he learned with LSD therapy um, over all his years of researching that, but um, without drugs. So anyway, that's... Because LSD had become illegal for him right, to use right. in his research. Right, it all got shut down yeah. when it became illegal. So anyway, um, that's how I, I went into psychiatry, interested in working with non-ordinary states, but thinking that 
it would have to be done without drugs, but finding how powerful breathwork could be. So anyway, Annie and, I, and, and Annie ended up, after thinking I'd been kidnapped by a cult for a while, she, she ended up going to the breathwork. I work. ended up loving the cult. She so. loved the cult too. So we both got kidnapped by the cult. And so we did. And it's not a cult, but it is no. a, just like an incredible part of our lives and really our big family. Yeah, it's definitely not a cult. And it's such a powerful way to learn to um, support, facilitate people's deep experience with or without psychedelics or with or without MDMA. Well, so that really influenced your residency because at the same time Michael was doing his residency, he also would be going to breathwork, the breathwork modules, the training um, for the two years that you did the training. So that really influenced how you thought about psychiatry. Yes, definitely. You know, I, I, I'd, I'd go out to California for a week or two at a time for the training modules with Stan, and then I'd come back and work on the in, inpatient unit at the Institute of Psychiatry in Charleston. And, um, you know, one time I did suggest to the attending, who was actually quite sympathetic with these ideas, um, I said, how about if we take a few people that, that come in really agitated and instead of giving them these drugs, how about if we try to work with them and process what's going on? And he said, um, well, that sounds very interesting. Are you willing to be here 24 hours a day? <laughs> because the other doctors and the nurses would completely freak out if we tried that. So that, that kind of brought home the fact that um, it wasn't ready for prime time mainstream psychiatry yet. But it was a, you know, it was very powerful for me that I got to see the examples of what could be done by supporting people to go more deeply into these intense processes um, at the same time as I was learning a lot about mainstream psychiatry. So that's, that's what really set us off working together for 10 years doing breathwork groups every month. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I went to, I went to the breathwork training and um, I've got to say, you know, um, other than having children, being with Michael for as much time as I've had, it has been one of the most powerful things in my life to do the breathwork training and witness, um, I mean, not only have Stan there for quite a bit of my training, but the other people, Tav, who we just lost last month, and um, Diane Haug, and some of our other teachers that um, came from that tradition, um, is really how I learned to be with people and be in intense states with people and being able to sit there and uh, um, just see the tremendous amount of healing work that would happen. Um, and so then when Michael became a psychiatrist and we started working together, um, we did groups, like Michael said, for 10 years with um, in the community in Charleston and also with some of the patients that would come to see Michael in his private practice so that we could work together with them somatically and also in the office. I would be there for some of the patients that he saw um, if in case they wanted to do some somatic body work um, or, and, and also some people who had dissociation. Um, we worked with a number of people who had dissociative problems. And um, I learned so much from those people too about being in these different kinds of states that, that happen. Um, yeah. And, yeah, and I'm trained as a nurse. So, um, you know, a lot of times people would come to see Michael for an, an hour and a half as um, his, the therapist and then come out and talk to me for another hour without paying me, you know, just to, <laughs> just to listen. So it was just like a, ri a really rich time in our lives of um, doing that work. Or sometimes people would be, you know, I'd be seeing a patient in the office and I'd offer the possibility of coming to a breathwork group and then they'd start doing that monthly or so. Um, and then after a while, some of them would say, well, you know, this has been great, but do you think I could like see Annie as my therapist <laughs> instead? 
<laughs> so, you know, I think it was, for us, it was so important to have those 10 years of so much um, experience of seeing what could happen in deep states without drugs. Because obviously, you know, we spent 20 years Medicines, now. let's say medicines. Yeah, medicines, yeah. Mm -hmm. So we, you know, we spent 20 years studying MDMA. We think it's a very important tool as well as other psychedelics like psilocybin and LSD, we think are very, very important tools. And it's really helpful to know to how powerful other methods of dropping into non-ordinary states can be and how to support them regardless of whether they're from medicines or not. And actually, I think it, the breath work and the use of medicines can really complement each other. Um, but for us, having that grounding in supporting people all those years in deep states, you know, over time and helping them integrate it with, without any medicines involved was a powerful lesson. And, I think it also helped us trust the process yeah. um, of that people can heal and come out. They can come in, they can go in looking like they're going into really murky, murky territory and really trusting that the inner healer, the inner healing intelligence can guide people through and trusting that. And, you know, even, even in breath work, groups it it may take longer than some of the psychedelics and mdma that we worked with but it it is some of what formulated our trust in that absolutely yeah, yeah. i mean so much of what we do is based on what we learned from stan and christina and uh, all the other teachers in breath work um, and of course we came to the point of realizing it didn't work for everybody so after you know, 10 years of doing breathwork groups and seeing a lot of people in, in the practice. And we were really focusing largely on trauma, treating PTSD. It seemed to just move that way. Um, and there were, you know, it was striking how helpful it was for many people to come to breathwork and also striking that there were still a significant number of people for which this wasn't adequate and which no other treatment was adequate. So there was every reason to believe that MDMA or other psychedelics could be useful based on all the early research and anecdotal reports. And so we just decided it's not acceptable that um, th this isn't being pursued anymore and hasn't been pursued for years, that people are earnestly coming and asking us, what can we do? Nothing is helping. And to know that um, there was probably things that they could do that we weren't allowed to offer them. Um, just seemed that, you know, really ethically unacceptable. So we decided, I guess, it'd be good to do some research with these and try to um, see if we can make them find out for sure if they should be accessible and make them accessible. So that's when I, well, I had the, you know, we thought maybe the only way to do it was to go to another country. And I, you know, I think last time I was saying I had, uh, I was seeing a, a patient who had opiate addiction and um, who uh, through her professional work had pretty easy access to, to um, opiates. And she'd been in multiple treatment programs, residential treatment programs and always relapsed. So one day after seeing her at the end of the day, I was listening to NPR and I heard about Deborah Mash's Ibogaine study. They had a, an interview with her and she was doing using Ibogaine in St. Kitts. She was from the University of Miami, but couldn't get permission to, couldn't get funding for research on Ibogaine, but she could use it in St. Kitts as a clinic and people could pay. So the next day I called up University of Miami and asked for Dr. Mash and it ended up that this patient went down there um, and I asked me if I would come to observe, which I did not as her. I said, I'm not coming as your doctor, but <clears throat> I'll pay my own way because I'm interested if you'd like me to be down there at the same time. So that gave me the idea um, that maybe that's the way to, to do research with psychedelics is to go offshore. So that's when in early 2000, I met Rick Doblin at a meeting and introduced myself and asked him, you know, 
which country he could advise us to go to for to do psychedelic research and um that's when this whole thing started he said you, you can do it here and we'll help you mm -hmm. so why don't you go home and write a protocol draft and we'll start working on it so we decided on mdma for ptsd would be a good way to start and that's what we've been doing ever since yeah and you know thinking back on those times um it was pretty rocky being in charleston south carolina and doing this research and having people um not want to even um say they knew michael <laughs> um the medical university we at, originally we were trying to do the um, research at the medical university and it became clear after um a number of number of months that the irb wouldn't look at the um approved protocol that we'd gotten from the fda and you know it was it, it was just we were isolated from people um and in an environment that wasn't really supportive and um luckily they wouldn't let us do it do the study at the medical university and we got to do it we went back to the fda and got approval to do it in our office which ended up being so much better um so we're grateful for that but yeah the times have really changed since then and you lost your medical appointment academic appointment didn't you michael over this uh it wasn't renewed in the middle of that I, you know i didn't work for them they didn't pay me anything but i was a you know they called it clinical faculty then they call it affiliate faculty now so um it when my appointment came up for renewal um it wasn't renewed and they didn't say it was because of the research formally um they said it was because i wasn't doing enough teaching and the rules had changed um so I don't know for sure that, it, but I was told by a number of people that it was that there were people on the committee that just thought they should have nothing to do with this research. Um, and although I was told also, you have your supporters, but there's some people that are very much against it. So for some years, I didn't have a, a faculty appointment. And then at, um, after the first study yeah, and after the paper. The, after the first study and we, yeah, when we got the first paper published in Journal of Psychopharmacology, that began to shift the attitudes, which now have shifted like 180 degrees. And now the medical school in Charleston, along with a lot of other places, uh, is starting a psychedelic research training and treatment center. But in those days, they didn't want anything to do with it. So, but then later after the first study that, uh, the new chairman, and then uh, one of the residents ended up getting uh, permission from the residency director for getting credit for one day a week, fourth year psychiatry resident, working with us one day a week on the research. So then I was teaching again a, a lot more. So, um, and the chairman then said, well, if you come give a talk to the department, um, I'll make sure that your detractors are there because I don't think they actually know that much about what you're doing. I just think they're allergic to psychedelics, basically. Mm -hmm. It's not the words he used, but so I did that and that then I ended up getting my my appointment back. So it's been very interesting how hard it was to for any academic center really to accept it. You know, we we tried to do a study at McLean. Uh, with um, MDMA and um, it did get approved eventually, but then there, it fizzled out. There wasn't recruitment. You know, now, as you know, Mass General is starting a psychedelic center. So mm -hmm. these, these academic attitudes have changed radically and which, um, you know, their attitude before was irrational because it wasn't based on science. The fact that at least it's changing that's a good sign because there's just so much published data now, mm -hmm. but it was a real, really problematic bias that this research wasn't done a long time ago. You know, the early promising data suggested that if you're paying attention to science and medicine, you would want, oh, look, well, here's some clues to something that might be really helpful. We should research this vigorously rather than shutting it all down. So 
it was slowed down tragically uh, for many years because of politics, not science, but now mm -hmm. science is prevailing. And that was partly why we, we decided to do the work with the MDMA. We'd had our own experiences together uh, alone and then as a couple and saw how powerful that medicine with, with was. With a therapist. With a therapist mm -hmm, back when it was legal, not illegal um, or not scheduled, let's say. Um, so, yeah. Hmm. Were you about to ask something? Well, I was curious, to, I mean, thank you for that historic perspective. And then how would you say it's affected the two of you together and individually over the last 20 years being involved? Mm. And, and to see the validation. I mean, you did the science that helped people realize this was important to look at even more. We, right. uh, we and many, many other people. <laughs> it's been a real community effort with yeah. MAPS and MAPS Public Benefit Corporation, all the donors. I just do want to acknowledge mm -hmm. that it took a, it did take a village and it's still taking a village and it's a wonderful village to be a part of. Mm -hmm. And all the other trainers, Marcella and Bruce and Boulder and all the other people that have worked at MAPS that have supported us. I mean, it's a hundred people now that it's about a hundred people in the two organizations together now, and it's growing fast. So, and of course, Rick incredible. has been dedicating his life to this um, long before we started, for more than thirty years. And when Rick dedicates his life, that's like two people dedicating their lives because he works twice as much as anybody else. <laughs> so you know, when I think about like um, first start, our first participant. And um, I don't know if we talked about that in the last the last time we talked, but um, you know, I've I felt like I have a part of me that is the um, well in the enneagram I'm a, the six I'm I have the loyal skeptic is I think the the term that describes the six. So I do have this like skeptical side of me that um, you know I think came into it, like even though I'd had these powerful experiences myself and saw how powerful it was for us, I still came into it like, well, I'm not sure, you know, um, if we can really help these people and, and the protocol and everything. So our first participant um, in the study, it was the first study was an inactive placebo versus MDMA, full dose MDMA. Um, we had worked with her for one breathwork session. I think her therapist came with her to that. Mm -hmm. And um, she came from a military background and said she couldn't imagine ever doing anything like a psychedelic. Um, and, but she said she would do anything because she really had severe symptoms. Um, she'd even go to Tibet to get healed. And, you know, it, it, her saying that wasn't like, she wasn't like this big meditator that knew like enlightenment came from Tibet, but, but she said that. And um, about an hour into her session, um, she lifted up her eye shades and she had this smile on her face and she said, I guess I don't have to go to Tibet and <laughs> to be healed. Um, and it was just, I mean, it was just like, when I think back at that, it was like, oh my gosh, you know, for her, she was getting that trust. And how did she know at an hour, you know, that she's not going to have to go to Tibet to heal? Mm -hmm. Somehow she got that information, maybe from her inner healer. Um, and, and it wasn't like everything magically disappeared and all of her symptoms went away but she did eventually she went through a lot of pain during her sessions but um also just thinking about us as therapists the fact that our first person got mdma and we learned that like oh my gosh and that's the first thing she said and that's us. the first thing she said <laughs> so getting MDMA. it was kind of like a, a validation of like oh, we can relax a little bit or, or trusting that there is this 
I mean, maybe it sounds a little woo woo, but there is this holding, I guess, with the medicine too, that we could trust that everything was going to be okay. And that's not to say that, you know, I had many sessions where I had to say to myself, trust the process, trust the medicine, um, go in the bathroom and breathe and settle myself and say those things to me. But, um, and, you know, I think Michael and I had learned a lot doing breathwork groups together. We, um, we kind of worked through our, our issues, I think, during that time of 10 years of breathwork groups, because, you know, some of the people that would come to the groups would be Michael's patients and have tremendous transference with him. And suddenly, there I am. And, you know, the wife is there, you know, <laughs> um, but not really, that's not my role during breathwork. But, you know, those, those things that are happening in therapy are different than what's happening with breathwork when you're working with someone. So I think we work through a lot of that and our own um, ability to be with intense processes. For me, I don't think I have the same capability as Michael does or stamina. It's more like stamina, it's not capability to be there and not get really tired. So during that time of doing breathwork groups, I feel like that grew for me. My, my capability of holding space for, um, you know, long days and people still being in process kind of at the end of breath work where you have to still work with people, um, that stretched for me. So some of that happened and we also had things still to learn about the sessions being together in the sessions. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the, the breath work together was really, really helped with a lot of things. But um, for me, it was, in, in a way, it was a wonderful crucible to be doing this research together for our relationship because it like turned up the, turned up the intensity on everything when you're, you know, working with people in these intense states and also trying to carry forward the research and uh, duking it out with the DEA and other people. So it's, it was a lot of intensity, which wasn't like I, I say that as like I I love that <laughs> so it wasn't a well, yeah you worked it, in the ER for 10 years it, it wasn't of a course you do <laughs> yeah the point I'm making it wasn't a burden to have that intensity no it, it, and working with Rick it and sped up mm -hmm. everything in a way mm -hmm. um and so for me what well, part of what I learned was you know the Enneagram was really helpful for both of us in understanding the way we interact because I you know, I'm a seven on the anagram. I tend to assume everything's going to work out. Um, and, and his imme immediate reaction is, well, wait a minute, what about all the stuff that could go wrong? So <laughs> my part of my growth, I think, um, that was very helpful to me was, um, you know, for, for quite a long time, I would kind of feel, well, if she could just relax and get more optimistic and just charge ahead, you know, the sky would be the limit. You know, I kind of felt like she was always, why was she bringing up the other side of it? Um, and then I realized, I mean, I will say, of course, it's not like I was ignoring all risk. I was an ER doctor. You do have to kind of pay attention to things. But still, I had basically about the research, uh, kind of assumed everything was going to work out. But then after time, I realized, wow, what a... Um, you know, what a blind spot that I'm feeling is if she's slowing me down, when in fact she's looking out. I, one of the reasons I'm pretty, I've been safe in assuming things would work out a lot of the time is because she's paid attention to the things that could go wrong and made sure we dealt, dealt with them. Yeah. So that was part of our growth. I think it was for me very beautiful and, you know, letting go and appreciating the way we complement each other. And mm -hmm. it just, that, that process has been over years and just makes it more fun and easier all the time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that's, that's lovely, thank you. And I wonder how you transmit that wisdom to new pairs who are working together. I mean, I, I know, and can you talk like to 
stop doing the research and start up phase three with so many new therapists. Um, and you know how you thought about training people to continue your legacy. Um, yeah, well, we spend a lot of time thinking about that. We don't think of it as our legacy, actually, but... No. but I knew you wouldn't use those words. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you. Um, so, uh, you know, one, one thing we don't know that much about is how other people come together as teams that aren't, haven't been married for 50 years. But we know it's possible, and actually Marcella and Bruce have had more experience with that because they've had lots of new teams at their sites. So um, it is a process, but happily we're seeing that, um, that obviously people can do it because you're one of the phase three therapists mm -hmm. uh, and you, you know, it's been going really well with all the new teams that have been through the training and um, people are figuring out how to work together really beautifully. And, over time. So I, right. that part of it, um, we're, we're still talking about the best ways to support people in doing that. But again, that's not really our area of experience because ours was so idiosyncratic, our working together. But um, in terms of transmitting the training, as you know, we're in the middle of kind of reevaluating. We've got some education consultants and trying to work out the best way to pass on material to new trainers because we want to develop a lot of new trainers um, in a way that is not, you know, our training is very idiosyncratic. Um, and it, we know that it needs more structure and no doubt could be improved anyway. Um, but we're working on how to develop it in a way that makes it easier for new training teams to start doing it. So well, we're in a period of figuring out how to expand the training a lot. Well, and, and, you know, the training that we did for you and all the other phase three therapists, um, including the breath work time that people did together. And, um, you know, it was really incredible to see how well that worked and to see when the new teams came together and had their, first participant with MDMA um, as part of the, the lead in for phase three to see how well people actually did work together. And, um, and we're really hoping that at the end of the month, we're going to see that the results for phase three look promising. So um, that, but, but to hand it off to new trainers, we realized that we had to formalize some of the competencies, I mean, the competencies of what we expect people to learn and how we can start to um, add new people, young people to the training teams. Um, so that's where, and the supervision. So that's where the, the work is right now with MAPS, with us and Marcella and Bruce really, and Shannon and Wes, who are Sarah, who are all part of the training um, team at MAPS, um, because that is the challenge. How do we get new therapists out there at, in expanded access? How do we supervise them? Um, how do we add new supervisors? And then we have the study starting in Europe, where they're going to need adherence raters and supervision. So that's kind of the challenge is how to grow. And um, what, that's what we've been working on lately. Yeah, and part of that is, you know, there are in a way a couple of parts to what we hope for people that, uh, uh, you know, psychedelic or MDMA therapists to um, do. And part of it is what we have been training in the training, like, you know, principles for working with non-ordinary states and the kinds of things that might happen with these medicines and the non-directive or interdirected approach that we think is so important to trust in the inner healer. That's, you know, we feel that we can demonstrate that pretty well and give people a feel for it in the amount of time we have for the training, which, you know, now is a 
going up toward 20 hours online and then about six or seven days in person and then some other things afterwards. So that's pretty limited. And then supervision afterwards will be a, is an important part of that, as you know. So there's that. And then there's also the perhaps more important or, or essential other part of it, which is the therapist having done enough of their own work to be able to be present with people and stay grounded and present even when it gets hairy and when they might be getting triggered. Um, and that is something you can't teach in a week or a year. And so, you know, part of it is we've been counting on people getting that someplace else. And many of people, of course, who come to the therapy training already have that. Um, but for younger therapists or therapists who haven't had that kind of opportunity to do their own inner work, that's gonna that's essential. And we're what we're not sure is the best way to make that available to people who haven't already had the availability of that. And that may be from that would that takes longer time to develop mm -hmm. that and the therapy experience. And then I guess the third part is kind of like experience working with what other population you're working with. Right. And where in a way there's three parts. So there's and for the PTSD study, there's deep experience in trauma therapy is very helpful. Um, although sometimes this involves forgetting some of what you've learned about therapy also, right. <laughs> but still that experience in supporting people, even in other methods of therapy can be really important. And then there's the principles of working with psychedelics. And then there's the personal presence and in you know, people's own inner work. And so all of those are, are really critical parts of this. Yeah. And I'm glad you brought up the other populations because that has been also a goal for MAPS. How do we get it out into um, other populations, more diversity, adding more therapists, so people of color, more diversity in that. So that has been happening, but it still, you know, needs a lot more work. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I have a few questions from, from <laughs> uh, the people who listened the last time. One is, um, how do you see MDMA being used to do group therapy in the future? Mm. Well, we're working on a protocol now to study that, um, which hopefully will start before too long. Um, and the, the model that we're thinking about starting with is um, that have assemble a group in, in the beginning, a pretty small group to start out with uh, six or eight people that would be kind of a cohort and then do a couple of group preparation sessions. And then each person will have one individual integration session followed by one Wait, the, you one experimental, one I'm sorry, medicine, one in, in MDMA the, session. Individual prep session. Okay, yeah. Two group oh. prep sessions, then an individual prep okay. session, then an individual MDMA session, then an individual integration session the next day. And that then that ends the individual part. And then after that, some more group integration and then a group MDMA session. And the, the idea would be the you know the agreements are different for the second one people get to have the first experience where they can talk as much as they are inclined and learn about time inside and time talking but then in the group the idea would be you know of course you can talk to the therapist but the goal is to support each other by staying inside and letting everybody have their process and then sharing and integrating together afterwards so that's what we want to try we've got a couple of potential sites we're not sure we've got a, some funding for it so hopefully that'll be starting within the next six months to a year and then so i think that's one way um that will make the make this more affordable for people right you know some people will clearly would be better off with individual sessions i'm sure but a lot of people could probably do well and, and group therapy also adds its own dimension, which can be very powerful. The group energy is beautiful. Mm -hmm. So I think it's an exciting area to look into some more. 
someone else asked also about using it in couples. And I know that some of your, some of the studies have done that and what is that going to move forward? And if so, how? Right. Well, we did the um, small pilot study with Candace Monson and Ann Wagner, um, where we look, we had six couples and we used Candace's uh, model of um, CBCD, cognitive, yeah, I, I like behavioral it. conjoint therapy. Yeah, so you're looking at how PTSD affects the relationship, and Candace has a manual um, where she divided it up into 15 weeks of therapy, and so we um, did Candace's training um, in her method. She did our training, and then we developed the protocol. We and Ann and Candace would come to Charleston. Um, for each of the MDMA sessions. So we did those together. Um, Michael and Candace worked and Michael and Ann, and so we divided up, I worked with them. Um, and it was really beautiful. Uh, six couples where one person in the couple has PTSD and the other person doesn't. And they had two MDMA sessions. Um, we did it two weeks apart. They had two MDMA sessions two weeks apart at first, and then we changed it and moved it a little bit further out to three weeks or four weeks with um, a lot of integration. So the integration um, the morning after was a lot like our integration where we're talking about where they are in the process and what they notice about the MDMA and what happened during the MDMA session. But then the follow-up um, calls would be on Zoom. And I mean, integration sessions would be on Zoom and they would be doing worksheets together where they looked at some of the cognitive thoughts that um, kept them stuck as a couple. Um, and it, it, it was just really, really incredible, the healing that happened with those couples. Um, they were all pretty, um, had pretty severe symptoms, the PTSD people. Um, participants, um, but it was amazing just to see the, um, the work that they did together. The integration work was beautiful and being able to see that other model work. So Ann Wagner is going to continue working just individually with uh, CPT and MDMA um, for a while, and then they're hoping to do another big study in Toronto with couples. And then there, you know, there are other studies that are the um, eating disorder and MDMA study. Has that got, that's gotten approval? Yeah. Yeah. There are a number of others in the pipeline. Yeah. The, the couple study was great because, um, you know, there were lots of anecdotal reports about how MDMA could help with couples work. And we'd had that experience ourselves and how beautifully it supported communication. Um, but we never, we were kind of had in the back of our mind, how would the FDA ever agree to let two people receive a medicine at the same time when one of them doesn't even have a, a diagnosis? But then when we met Candace, and uh, that was through uh, a meeting that uh, the late Richard Rockefeller uh, helped us get with, and Richard and Rick and I met with the leadership of the National PTSD Center that runs all the treatment and research in the VA. And Candace was on that call. She had been at the Boston VA before she went to Toronto. Uh, and uh, so, um, you know, when we started talking about doing something together with Candace, we realized, you know, she's got the data that we can use to argue the couple is the patient. So we need to give them both MBMA. And we had no, actually the FDA didn't push back on that at all. So, and as Annie said, it was an uncontrolled trial, but seemed to be very powerful. And Anne will do a controlled trial later. And Anne and Candace will probably do that together in Toronto. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one thing that was very interesting was how we decided, as we kind of predicted, we didn't do any formal cognitive behavioral conjoint therapy in the MDMA sessions. We just used basically our same method. But we used the and Candace's method, the CBCT, for preparation and integration, and it was especially useful for integration, especially for the 
you know, with two people working together, I'm not very oriented toward cognitive behavioral therapies, but I was impressed that how useful it could be for the integration process because it gave them some structure to work together and communication and things. So I think that's going to be a really exciting area. Mm -hmm. Well, and avoidance, how they would help each other if they were avoiding certain things, that would be part of their homework and they would have to do that together. So yeah, the camaraderie of them working well and the MDMA helped them have the momentum to do those things, just like individually, that's what happens. It's, it, you know, MDMA is a catalyst for a healing process and people get momentum to start doing those things that they've avoided and to see that it was, it was really beautiful. Mm -hmm. That's great. And maybe some of those techniques can be used in group therapy. Can mm -hmm. grow from there. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So another question is um, what your thoughts are on how to use the MDMA assisted psychotherapy to prevent the effects of trauma from taking root. So working with younger populations or working with people closer to the time of the event, the traumatic events. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of veterans have said, you know, I, well, I wish I could have had this when I got back from Iraq or Afghanistan uh, instead of nine years later or something. Mm -hmm. um, so th that's, I think that's another promising area for research. It's a hard thing to study because, you know, if you, I think it could be great to have an MDMA session after deployment um, as to process the whole experience and see how much it could prevent PTSD possibly. That would take big numbers because, you know, a lot of people don't develop PTSD after deployment and you don't know who's going to at that point. So, mm -hmm. but it would be a great study to do. And of course the VA could afford to do such a thing. So <laughs> well, we're, and, and, and we're trying to, we're getting some stuff going in the VA. So maybe something like that would happen. Well, and the thing is, is if you think about, we did see a number of veterans who did have PTSD for 10 years and, you know, to see how their life had changed over the, those 10 years, it, it doesn't start out as severe, but it ends, can end up being very severe, severe and debilitating and, you know, no, they can't have work. They're, inside, isolated, lost a lot of their family, um, sometimes their marriages are uh, going down the tubes because of all the symptoms. So to catch that earlier would save a lot of money too for the mm -hmm. VA. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I know the FDA, once the, assuming the phase three studies are going to be what we hope they're going to be, that then the next step will be to study teenagers and then to study even younger people. So that also may be a chance to address that question of getting to it quick, getting to the closer to the trauma for treatment. Yeah. 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 The FDA has not allowed us to enroll anybody less than 18 so far, but then they have a requirement that post approval, but actually when MAPS applies for the uh, new drug application, um, they have to submit a plan for a, for pediatric studies. And the first one would be 12 to 18. And then if that goes well, then there would be a requirement for one for people from six to 12. And will those populations be people who've had trauma? Do, or do we know yet what the studies are? Yeah, this would be all, 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 under trauma. The, all, all under the indication for PTSD, yeah. Okay, yep, mm -hmm. great. Good. Then another issue that I know is coming up a lot now in this, in the bigger field is the, maybe the, the word, the medicalization of these medicines. Um, you know, you're, you spoke so beautifully of being so strongly rooted in the breath work, work um, which has a very spiritual basis. So how has it felt for you going from the breath, this more medicalized um, place and then where is it going now? How's that feeling? Mm. It's very complicated for me. Um, you know, when we we've heard from some people all along that maybe this isn't a good idea, um, bringing it into the medical world, um, maybe it's going to lose the essence or something like that. 
But for us, it was, you know, we knew plenty of people who could access underground therapy and had the money and the willingness to do that. Um, but we were seeing in our practice every day people that didn't have the money or the willingness to, to do that and were suffering. So that's where we're coming from, that um, with some misgivings and the need for attention to the pitfalls, I still think this is very important. Otherwise, it's just kind of an elitist uh, endeavor that is not available to so many millions of people that need better treatment. So we're solidly in favor, obviously, of, of doing it that way. And we recognize potential pitfalls mm -hmm. um, because, you know, look at the history of pharmacology. Um, it's not, it, there have been some amazing um, accomplishments and there's been a lot of very problematic, profit-driven, um, direction away from just following science and you know getting stuck in uh you know patenting isomers once a patent is running out rather than developing anything new all that very problematic history so people have a reason to be uh concerned i think and we have a reason to want to make sure we do this well and deal with those pitfalls in order for people to have this treatment Right. Well, and also, um, we know, and I'm sure you saw this too, Anne, working in the phase three study, that there's a lot of um, work and people need a lot of support. It's, it's not just the MDMA sessions. It is, it sometimes turns people's lives upside down, this work, um, for the good. I mean, really, that's mm -hmm. what needs to happen but it can shake up a whole family and everyone knows that that heart, good therapy will shake up the whole system but you know mdma and i'm not as familiar with the other medicines as far as like how they the integration period goes but um it's can be really rocky for people and they need a tremendous amount of support and are you know people in the general medical field going to understand that. Um, so, you know, it's so important to train people, um, but as it gets further out there, um, the things Michael was talking about, about doing your own work and um, being solid with how you, be, you are with people has a big effect on how this therapy works. And, also that it's not just the medicine, you know, it is um, finding other ways to heal and, and integrate what you've learned. I mean, it's not just like taking medicine over and over again. It is finding other ways that you can integrate what you learn into your life. And so how is that going to be held? And so those are, those are the places I think that I worry about. And I think ketamine is a, a good example in a way that you can see what's happening with ketamine. Um, a lot of clinics are opening up just giving ketamine infusions with no therapy or real talking at all. Clearly, there's some, you know, neurochemical effect of on depression for at least for a short period of time with ketamine. So it's not useless, but it's missing the opportunity for compared to the places that are doing ketamine assisted psychotherapy where you know a lot of research is needed but it appears that um, that may solve the problem of the treatment run you know needing another treatment in two weeks or that kind of thing we don't know but I think one advantage with NBMA at least is that you know according to what we discussed with FDA so far at least it's good, its indication is going to include is going to be about MDMA assisted psychotherapy. People are going to have to provide it in clinics with trained therapists. We're, it's not going to dictate that they have to do the therapy exactly the way we do it because there should be innovation. But it's going to be indicated as a therapeutic, you know, psych, psychotherapeutic adjunct, not just a drug indication. So that will help. Because ketamine, of course, was an approved drug long before 
um, mm -hmm. that's used for depression. So um, that'll help, but it's still, you know, it's still going to be a, probably a wild ride. And I think important to pay a lot of attention to maintaining the quality and the um, essence of what we think is important in this approach. Thank you. Thank you. Very, very helpful and beautiful to be with you. Any yeah. last words as we get to the end of our hour? Um, well, a lot of appreciation for what you're doing mm -hmm. in Boston with this incredible growing group, which is no longer just in Boston, <laughs> but uh, it's a yeah. it's great. And as I think I said last time, um, when I was talking to Rick the other day about some of these, all this enthusiasm, all the young people, you know, young but very qualified people who are coming up with all these investigator initiated research trials and these centers at the major universities. And it was after a call about that, I said to Rick, you know, I just suddenly felt something relax inside. <laughs> that after 20 years of thinking, you know, if we mess up this next step, it'll all go down the tubes. <laughs> yeah. And suddenly feel realizing, oh, this is gonna this is happening. Um, it's not it's not all dependent on just our MAPS trials. And it's there's just so many mm -hmm. passionate, qualified, wonderful people coming along, taking up this direction in their careers that uh, it just feels, uh, and Rick said he felt the same way that mm -hmm. we both kind of felt like, okay, we don't want, we don't want to die now, but if we did, it would be okay. <laughs> it would still happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Anne. So it's, it's been great to see your group grow and be a part of it and be able to be there with them for, for these two times. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. We got a twofer. <laughs> <laughs> Lucky us. Just one last thing I'd like to um, mention is that we spe I specifically had asked Danny and Michael to talk more about their personal experiences. For those of you who don't know about the MAPS research, the best way to learn about that is to go on maps.org. Um, and there's many, many, many um, sources there to learn about the research. They publish papers, the protocols are there, the training manuals are there, and much, much more. So, and also if you have questions, be in touch with us at the Boston Psychedelic Research Group. We have a, a good team here with lots of information. So, thank two, you. Two new papers just got accepted this week. One oh, about really? couples and one about eating disorder. Great, and can you tell us where they're gonna be published? Uh, I'm not sure whether okay, I should for them. Uh, oh. No, we won't. I won't press yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> we'll look for them on the MAPS website. That's it's great. been nice to meet you too, Sherry. Yeah. 